So to start us off, um, I thought maybe if you could just give us a little overview. As I mentioned, you started out in Chicago as an actor. Can you tell us a little bit about the path that took you from Chicago to Los Angeles and how you kind of diversified your career along the way? Um, sure, I'll even back up a little bit. Just um, I grew up in a, a tiny little farm town in Kentucky, sort of part of the, the Southern United States. Um, and really like credit to my parents for kind of not having any opinion on, on what I did when I, when I grew up, um, other than encouraging me to go to college. Um, having kids of my own, I hope that I can, I can sort of be a little hands off and let them find their way because I don't know why this little farm kid thought I was just going to grow up and be an actress, but, um, but somehow I thought that would be a delightful thing to do. Um, so I really went to college and majored in theater. Um, and with, with this, this vision that I was going to be a very serious, um, actor, uh, <laughs> And in hindsight, Elizabeth, I wish one of my professors was go had said, you can also be a humorous actor. <laughs> For some reason, comedy wasn't sort of given a lot of um, attention at our school, but it, so it took me a little longer to figure to figure out um, that that was a, a better path for me. But I started acting um, in Chicago and just, you know, working at coffee shops and auditioning for plays in weird places that didn't pay and so on and so forth. And, and my dream had been to, to get my equity card, which is the, the union, you know, actor card um, and go to New York and become an, an actress. And I ended up getting a couple of commercials um, and getting my SAG card, which is a Screen Actors Guild, guild um, you know, the, the TV and movies versus um, stage work. Um, and I sort of used that as a clue to tell me maybe to go to Los Angeles um, and, and, you know, do more on camera stuff because um, I couldn't seem to get an equity card. Um, and that's what I did. So I traveled to Los Angeles. Um, I did also got, got a job in another coffee shop. Um, and, uh, and started, um, luckily getting work, um, commercial work, but the, but the rest really eluded me for, for a long time. Um, and then I started doing stand up really as a way to, uh, just not sit around waiting for the phone to ring, which now I, I admire all the opportunities, although perhaps it feels overwhelming that people can make movies with their, their cell phone and create, um, you know, a, create opportunities for themselves to perform and be seen and do things um, that kind of wasn't maybe available um, at the time. But I, so I was started doing stand up um, and got a little attention for that. I wasn't like a big, great stand up. I got a little attention, got an agent from doing that. Um, and I, then I started getting attention for my writing. I didn't quite realize that when you're doing stand up, you're writing jokes, you are being a writer. Um, so I really thought I was only pursuing acting when in fact I was sort of training myself to be a writer. Um, I also took classes at the Groundlings Theater, which really became, um, which is an improv, kind of a famous improv um, theater in uh, Los Angeles. Um, kind of similar to what they do on Saturday Night Live, sort of sketch comedy. Um, and that also became a good training ground for writing comedy because I was writing sketches to perform. Um, and then I, uh, I wrote my, uh, I, I wrote a little stage play, uh, again, just to sort of stay energized and active. Um, and that got a lot of attention um, and ended up getting me a writing agent to which I kept saying, I don't think I'm a writer. I really just did that play so that you could see my amazing acting. And they were like, well, the acting was okay, but, um, but we really liked the writing. And so that's where I learned a lesson that I, I, I share with, with younger people when I can, um, because I, I was really kind of kicking and screaming about, you know, feeling like I was giving up one career for the other. Um, and an acting coach, um, advised me she said this is an amazing opportunity and she said ride the horse in the direction it's going um That's and so yeah I don't think she made up that phrase but it's a good one that I like ride the horse in the direction it's going so I signed with that writing agent and really dove into the writing and ironically I ended up getting more acting opportunities 
um, than I had previously because I didn't totally give it up. Um, although it's been a little bit of a challenge to keep both of those balls in the air and, and I have for long stretches had to give it up. Um, but it was interesting by focusing my, focusing my energies in one area, some opportunities opened up in the other. So um, I don't even remember what the start of the question was. <laughs> I like where we got to though, because okay. it, gets us, it actually gets us to an interesting question that one of our audience members sent in, which was, uh, do you find one or the other of these sort of art forms more rewarding or are they just all different? Acting well, you know, I, yeah, I, I saw that question and I appreciated the way it was phrased because I often get the question, do you, which one do you like better? Um, and I, I mean, I, I like the one that I have. I like whichever one is in front of me usually or wherever I can make the my next buck. But um, but the reality is if I had to say, what do I like better? Well, I like acting better because it's easier. It's, um, you know, you get somebody else putting your makeup on. Like it's very indulgent and, and, um, and fun um, in that way. So it's easy to like the acting piece better. But in terms of that question, I was like, oh, I hadn't thought about it. What's the mo more rewarding? Um, and I would probably say ultimately the writing is more rewarding because then you have truly created a world that people can go into. And when, when people have seen my series, The Big C, for example, and give me a compliment on that or say that they watched it with their mother who had had cancer, like it just feels like bigger um, and grander. Now, listen, I also have a lot of like insecurities and white hot shame. So mostly I'm thinking, ooh, all those things I wish I'd done differently about whatever project that was. Um, but, it, but in terms of what is truly more rewarding or I feel like leaves the bigger stamp, um, for me, it, it probably is the writing and creating. That's, that's interesting. And I can imagine that that would be true just because as you said, when you create a world like that, it's kind of all you. And to see that realized must be really satisfying and gratifying. Do you find also that, I mean, I assume the answer is yes, but I don't want to assume. How do the different things that you do inform each other? Like your acting, how does that inform your writing or vice versa? Well, I, um, you know, I, I actually a lot of friends of ours, Elizabeth, who, who studied acting are now writing. Um, and a lot of actors do become writers. Um, and I will say that something I noticed right away when I started writing, and, and I think the reason some of my writing got attention and popped was because I write words that will, will be fun to say. So I, I often, um, you know, get actors attached to my scripts because they're excited to say the words and um, you know, th because they're written from an actor's point of view and yeah. I pretty much act out everything I say, I write, even if it's not, you know, even if it's a dude character or whatever it is, I'm sort of acting it out as I'm, as I'm writing. So the acting definitely informs the writing in terms of literally creating words and phrases and sentences that are fun to come out of one's mouth. And they get very natural. I mean, I've watched I've watched a lot of your a lot of your work, and it is very you. And it's also it's very natural. And I mean, if you're if you're used to performing as an actor, and if you're sort of acting the scenes out as you go, you don't get into the situation where you're writing something that feels like awkward and weird to say. It's so it, everything is so natural. It's really amazing. Yeah, I will say um, I'm 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 going to sort of just branch off here and there. So uh, bring me back if you want. Um, I have uh, I actually, as a writer and producer, sometimes struggle with my relationship with actors, and this is why. Um, because as an actor, I have such a respect for the creator and the writer and the words because I know what goes into it. So I. I am just full of gratitude when I'm acting and I just, I say the words and I make them as best I can. And if I legit have a, something I think can be helpful or something I want to try, I may, I may bring that up, but, uh, but I try to just honor the work. So when I get actors who are questioning the writing or say that something doesn't make sense, I, it's hard for me to be kind about that because 
I, in my mind, and I may have said this out loud a few times, oh, I know it makes sense. It makes sense. I, I acted it out. I already did it. Like, it does make sense. You may not be struggling to make sense of it. And, and let me help you do that. And I will say Laura Lenny from the Big C was a master at being able, she had a great respect for the words, but also with times would come and say, I'm having trouble making a connection here. Can you help me understand this? And then I'd, I'd be all in. I was like, oh yeah, let me help you understand that. Let's figure this out together in a way that makes sense to you. But I've also worked with actors who, I mean, crazy stuff would say, this isn't funny. This doesn't make sense. Oh my God. And that is a very, like, that is not an, an uncommon thing to say. If you have one actor who does it, it bleeds over into the other actors. And I tell you as a showrunner, as a writer, that if actors don't know this, they need to know. We spend so much time in the writer's room bitching about those actors because it's so big, like therapeutically, like you have to get it out because it is so hurtful and so difficult, um, you know, when, when actors don't respect the words that then you have to be like, oh. Okay, so those come from you. I mean, that's like, you're pouring yourself onto the page. And when somebody's criticizing it, it's like, it, I can imagine that it would be hard not to see that as a repudiation of you as an artist and a person. I can imagine that could be really difficult. That's right. And I think I think my message is, and what I try to tell people is to, to, under, to try to understand the bigger machine of what is getting created. There is a machine at work, you know, whether it's a film or a TV show, there is a whole machine with a ton of people um, trying to like uh, create this. So, you know, do your job of whatever that is and try to have a respect for the bigger machine. Um, I, that, that's, that's so important. And, and, you know, if you, if there are actors here listening, part of that machine is understanding when you get rejected for a role or you get called back that you don't get the part, like it's not as personal as you think it is. You think it's because you didn't say that one line right and you didn't, you didn't get emotional enough in that one thing and you screwed it all up. But really the most likely scenario on the other side of the camera, what we most often see when we're casting is that, wow, there's a lot of amazing actors. Everybody was fabulous. I just saw 50 actors who were really good. Uh, but this one looks more like um, this other guy and they're supposed to be brothers, so we're gonna cast him. Or this, this woman, um, you know, just had a, a, a quirkiness about her that spoke to the role. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I can't tell you, I, I, I wish I could, could reach out to all the actors that were amazing that we didn't cast for the most arbitrary reasons. Um, because I, I know as an actor, you take it all very personally and think it was you, but like, nope. You did your job, just go on to the next one. And, and knowing, knowing that, having that experience on the other side of the camera, are you able to tell yourself that when you go through auditions as an actor? I am, I am. I, I, my, my perspective changed dramatically when I saw what was on the other side. Um, and if there's ever an opportunity to see auditions, um, you know, take that opportunity or to be on the other side because it, it changed it changed dramatically. And I also, now I just kind of relax, relax into it. And when I audition, I pretend like I already have the role. I just show up as who I am. I kind of, I do my things. The ones where you can tell somebody is green because they show up and they, every word is they're trying to say it exactly right. And everything is so precious rather than just showing up and being your, like just bringing yourself or your, whatever your essence is to that role in the most relaxed way. So I always tell myself, oh, I've been playing this role for three seasons. I'm three seasons in. Let me just go without these lines. Yeah. Are you, so are you, as a writer, correct me if I'm wrong, you wouldn't be as involved in the casting process as a writer, but you would be as a producer. Is that right? Well, a writer generally is a producer in, uh -huh. in, in Hollywood. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's like a whole algorithm that is so bizarre when you first hear it. But um, 
but the word producer, there are non-writing producers and there are writing producers. And certainly if you're creating a show or you're, um, you know, even all the people who make up the writer's room, if you're just hired to write on a show, like your very first entry level job will just be like staff writer. And then it, uh, then it goes to like story editor and then it goes to producer. Um, supervising producer, co-executive producer, executive producer. So the producer title um, is, is can mean many things. It's misleading because um, we all watch, I mean, I pay more attention to it now because of you, but like when you watch the credits at the end of a TV show, there's like 10 million producers and like six executive producers. And I'm always like, what yeah. are, who are these people? What do they do? Yeah, exactly, and most of them, man, many of them will be writers, yeah. That's really interesting. Huh, I, yeah, okay, I've already learned something, something new tonight then I would say. Um, you know, we touched on this a little bit in terms of the acting aspect, but one of our audience members asked, how do you deal in general? Well, the entertainment field in general is quite tough, whether you're acting or producing or writing. How do you deal with the insecurities that naturally come up and, and setbacks that you have faced? Um, you know, in terms of the setbacks, I was reading this article, um, uh, an interview uh, with Arnold Schwarzenegger this morning. It was just in the paper. I know that's such a weird that's reference. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, but he said something that totally spoke to me where I was like, oh, that's how I feel. And he said, I'm not afraid of failure because there's the floor. That's as far, far as I'm going to fall. And then you just, you know, keep going. And I felt, I was like, oh, I feel the exact same way. I'm always like, what's the worst that can happen? Or when I get rejected, which is, and my husband will say, he's like, your great strength is that you just take rejection so well. Like, I don't even... I can't even work up a good cry over a rejection anymore. <laughs> like it just, I just kind of almost assume the no. And then when it's a yes, it's very exciting. Um, so, um, you know, and, and part of that is like learned because there, there were many tears along the way. There's lots of therapists oh, yeah. along yeah. the way. Yeah, a lot of therapists along the way. I'm not a religious person, but every now and then I'll just like, pray it out because I'm like, just got to attach myself to the fact that like these words, this job is not like, you know, is not, is meant not to be. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. That it's just not, it's not the biggest thing in the world. Um, but the other thing I would do is sort of some, well, there's two things. I also always recommend this when I do a panel and I was on a panel once where somebody else recommended it. And I was like, Hey, that's my thing. So I love them. <laughs> I loved that she did too, but there's a, a book called The Artist's Way. Um, did you ever do that? I just um, remember a lot of people doing it in college. I don't think yeah. I actually did. And I did, it, I did it long after college. Does anybody know that? Does not see any nods, but um, it's a book called The Artist's Way. And it, it's literally like kind of, it's like a 12 week or something. And it like gives you little activities to do every week. And it sounds super dorky. But I am telling you, there is some sort of magic in it because as an artist, as a creative person, you kind of have to just train yourself to stay in that cool, creative place and to keep marching forward and being creative, you know, no matter what kind of the world is telling you. And it was in doing the, the artist way work that I ended up finishing like my first little play that got me so much attention and got this, this agent. Um, and then, like I said, uh, uh, oftentimes that will come up in conversation and very frequently I will find other um, actors, writers, producers um, who have done that artist way. And it's just a good, it's just a good way to kind of um, keep yourself in a creative headspace. And, and also to answer your question as far as how was I deal with the rejection and that being horrible and emotional, but then I just keep reminding myself to like get active. Okay, well then do the next thing. I used to have a rule where I had to do one thing for my career every single day. Um, and sometimes that was mailing in, you know, um, 
material to agents and managers and, and you know, just putting things in the mail and be like, good, okay, I did something. Um, or looking for auditions or writing for an hour or, um, you know, sometimes it was going to the movies, but some, something that made me feel like I was putting energy into what I wanted out of my creative career. I mean, this is something I love in the, I can only speak about the American uh, and maybe a little bit the British environments and not not necessarily how it is in, in all of the countries that you all are from, but that sense of sort of entrepreneurialism that artists have, you know, like when we were both living in Chicago and doing those, t some of the more terrible plays in very small theaters, you know, it's like people just get together and they're like, we're going to make a play happen. I mean, you are, we yeah. did the crazy thing in college. That was the first experience I had when we got together and we said, we're going to do an evening of all scenes by American female, not American, by female playwrights. And that was, it's very empowering. Even if, uh, you know, you're in a small theater or even if you're doing it in your high school auditorium or whatever, someone had asked a question uh, from the audience about how, as a young person, how as a high school student, can you become involved and head down this path? And that's a great way, you know, writing or putting something together yourself that's small and it's very empowering. So, I, you yeah, know. we, I, Elizabeth, I don't know if you were actually part of the writing process, but in college, a group of us got together and wrote a play aimed at high school students. Um, and like we, I don't know, we convinced like a professor to give us college credit for it or whatever. <laughs> and then we, we ended up touring that play around, you know, a big chunk of the US and performing in high schools and getting paid for it. Um, and then that play was published and now like I get a check every year for it. It's so crazy, but Elizabeth and I performed in that together, but I don't think you were the initial writing. I was not, I wasn't, no, I came in later. I was not one of the cool kids from the beginning, but uh, yeah, yeah, I joined just being self-motivated is, I think, the answer to that. Yeah. yeah, agreed. That's wonderful advice. And I know a lot of you had questions about different kinds of advice. Uh, so that's a, a great takeaway is make your own, make your own art and stay creative. I love that. Um, speaking of creativity, when you are creating a show or even when you're a writer on a show, do you have, do you have sort of a process, like a standard sort of creative process, no matter what the project is, or is your process kind of different each time? Well, okay, there's a, a few different things. Once you get into like the TV writing more, well, any writing, movie writing or whatever, there is such a formula to that for both, whether it's TV, whether it's movies. So there, you know, it's a very kind of formulaic, um, end result, right? You have like, when I get submitted uh, somebody's script to read, the first thing I do is let's see how many pages it is. And if it's not within the ballpark of whatever um, it is, whether it's a single cam um, or a multi-cam um, TV script or a screenplay, I get very nervous. Um, but that's just, I don't know, it's just a habit of I have and the first thing I do or I'll open it up and see where, where the act one ends. Um, Cause I wanna see how like, you know, how this person sort of know how is, how green they are, because it should be pretty close. Um, so, you know, there is that formula that if you really, is, and sometimes when I'm like, well, I wonder if I could beat, it, would this story work? And I kind of try to beat it out in the act structure and the beats that I know, but, then at the same time, I kind of have a scattered process, to be honest with you. I try to get in touch with the, the really the emotional core of what I'm going to write and what I love about it. Because if I only start following sort of the outline or the, the structure that I know semi well, then it's not going to have enough of the spark and the heart and the like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So then I have to, at the same time, just sort of, you know, sometimes I'll just think of a monologue of a character and I'll write that monologue as my very first thing. And sometimes that monologue doesn't even end up in the end result of the script, but that's kind of what inspires me. So I try to find like, oh, what, you know, what is it about this project? And, oh, I, 
you know, I want to write, like right now I'm working on something that um, is, is sort of from the area I grew up in, like a southern, a rural southern show. Um, and so I, I'll just come up with little snippets of dialogue or little, um, you know, characters and start to describe them. And, and it's just kind of a messy document of all these different like pieces. And then slowly and surely I'll start to like formulate them into an organized for that, it would be a pitch that I'm going to pitch it to the studio uh, before I write it. So into an organized formulaic pitch, or if it's an actual script, I'll do the same thing, little dialogue, little this, and then I'll start, start putting it in the areas they belong. Okay, that's going to be part of act one. That's going to be part of act two. That's so cool though, because it seems like you have these little pieces and then the characters and their lives kind of start to coalesce out of these pieces you've created. It sounds kind of magical almost, although I'm sure it's mostly a lot of hard work. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and also every, I admire the people who can just um, kind of like organize. Yeah, there's some famous screenwriter who um, says that he just sets down like on page one and just, just writes all the way to the end, very literally. So it kind of depends on how you think. Sure. Um, yeah. You know, one thing I wanted to jump in off of the questions, because I always feel like this is things that people are waiting to hear, um, which is how do you get your, once you have something, like, how do you get it read? And how do you get, like, you know, what is the next step? And, uh, and what do you do with that piece of material, especially if it's, if it's writing? Um, and there's a couple of tips that I've, I've learned along the way that, that I share, and maybe you know these, or maybe you don't. But um, and again, I don't know your world versus Los Angeles is kind of the only world I know. But hey, lots of people here would love to have work produced in Los Angeles, so I, this is wonderful information. Um, but so having a writing agent is sort of like your your golden ticket a little bit, because then you if you have an an agent who likes and um, respects your work, then they become your workforce to like, I'm gonna get it in front of these people, I'm gonna show it to this producer, I'm gonna get it to a meeting over here. But now getting that, ag that agent is, is not always an easy task. Um, and a lot of the bigger agencies don't, don't read unsolicited work. So just, now that's not to say I wouldn't just try it, like to just- Why not? Because why not, exactly. Um, and I have done that. But, um, but what I have heard um, is that managers, writing managers do read unsolicited work. So um, again, at least in Los Angeles and New York, um, if you were able to get a list, they, they exist somewhere of, um, managers who represent writing talent those people do read unsolicited work you send them and maybe they'll read it and spark to it and then they say hey let me help you and then the first thing that they would probably do is help you get an agent right um uh, and then you know and then you're off to the races so that's just one very specific thing that i was always like i, I wish i had had known that um, you know, there's also these contests and things that people always ask about. I've also like sent things to these contests and that can be another road to, um, to just getting yourself, your material like seen and read. And a lot of the prizes for those of like the top three get read by an industry professional. Yeah. Um, and that can be another way to just, you know, try, try to get, um, something read. Um, somebody had a question about, about producers and becoming a producer, even, I think, yes. uh, yeah. and, and, um, the, there are the producers, cause I think the question was, do you just have to have a lot of money or producers? Right. Yeah. Do you, have money? you have to have money to invest in a show basically. Yeah. And, and those people exist. Those like super wealthy people who make their money some way, and then they want to get in their entertainment business and start producing um tv um yeah i don't know anything about how to advise you to make all that money um, <laughs> step one make a ton of money the producers that i i work with 
um, are literally just start at the ground up the way a writer or actor would. And most of them in Los Angeles, when I quiz them, they almost always have the same answer. I started in the mail room of an agency. So they get like the bottom rung job at a talent agency, one who represents writers and work their way up. And then at, when you work at an agency, then you'll get put as an assistant on somebody's desk. And then you're reading material and reading and then if you're either you're, you want to become an agent and you'll kind of pursue that, or if you're saying, well, now I really want to be a producer, then you start looking for that, those jobs, but now you're more connected because you know everybody in town, you've been, in, you've been talking to them as you're setting up meetings for other people. Um, and then those producer jobs, you know, you work for somebody's what they call a pod or somebody's company. Um, and a lot of like famous actors get pr production companies where they're, and it's literally just because, you know, I, I've worked with Elizabeth Banks company. I actually love her. She's amazing, but really the produce, <laughs> what's that? That's so nice to hear. It's nice when someone you admire also, someone says, oh, they're yes. also really great and nice. And also because she's a director. So she just has this director energy of like being able to like um, sort of, you know give you comfort and sort of command a room but also be very like i'm here to support you what do you need but it's really her producer so a woman who worked her way up in the in the uh, from the ground floor of a of an agency worked in the mail room uh, and then get, got a job as a producer in elizabeth banks company and she reads materials, finds stuff she likes, meets writers, tries to attach them to projects. Um, and I worked with her on a project and it was so successful that then, you know, after my, my most recent series we wrapped, I, she was the first person I called and was like, Dana, what do you, what should we do? And she's like, okay, I've got this and this, what do you want to do? And so it's a, it's a producer that I found a connection to and, and I like working with. But anyway, I hope that answers somebody's question if they were interested in becoming a producer or what is producing. And she, at her company, she produces both TV and movies. That's all right. I just jumped around. No, that's no, this is great. I mean, it's we're, we're actually I think we're getting to a lot of your questions, everybody, uh, in our roundabout way, because that leads to it because you mentioned Elizabeth Banks um, company. Somebody had asked, and I think it's an interesting question, are there any particular challenges or advantages, I guess, being a woman in this industry, do you think, in your experience anyway? You know, I think um, I'm a little bit nose to the grindstone and I don't even, I mean, sometimes I look back on things and I was like, wow, I was super sexually harassed then, but I didn't, I'm so friggin' naive that like, I just, I'm always like, what's happening? Um, but I, in hindsight, um, you know, I, I have written so, like a ridiculous number of pilots that didn't go to series, that didn't get picked up to series. And I did a panel once and somebody was like, if you wrote that many pilots that didn't get picked up, why did they keep hiring you? They were literally like, well, if you keep writing shit that nobody wants, why, why are we, what's going yeah. on? <laughs> he's, yeah, it's like, you must be terrible. And I was like, I was like, well, first of all, <laughs> I know, thank you so much for that comment. <laughs> I wonder who that person was, because I still think about that all the time. But it was actually, it was like, you know what, that is a fair question. Because at that point, when I did the big C, I had written about 18 pilots that did not go, did, did not get made, didn't even get made, but I got hired and paid to write them. And so, you know, it's, it's a very successful way of being unsuccessful, right? But my point was, well, they liked the writing. They liked the stories I was pitching. They liked everything I did. But at the 11th hour, they can only like each, each network can only make like three things, three, you know, actually make three pilots. And mine just never got chosen in that very tiny window. Now, the really exciting news that since then, since the big C now, all these streaming outlets, you know, more at the time, I would have thought like, wow, TV is dying. I'm never going to be able to sell anything anywhere because, you know, there's more reality shows and whatever. But the truth is there's so many 
places looking for content. So it's a very exciting time to be a writer um, and an actor and an artist. So my point is when I look back on that, I was like, well, listen, I, I was successful in that I got it that far and it's really hard to be one of those top three. Now, when I look back, I'm like, hmm, hmm. Those top three were usually men, usually <laughs> white guys. I would say usually white men, yeah. Yeah, who usually got in those top three. Not always, but you know, so if I think like, was it harder as a woman? Probably, I think there were ways when I was disadvantaged that I didn't even realize. Yeah. But here's the other good news. Um, you know, especially for people of color, people, uh, women, like now we're at a point where the there's been so much pressure on the industry that now they're like actively looking for, we need a, we need a, you know, we need more women in that room. We need more people of color in that writer's room. Like people are getting opportunities with less experience and there's a lot more energy. So in that way, and then I know some of like my white guy friends were like, Oh, I can't get a job. Mm, yeah. uh, <laughs> but but that's okay. There's, I mean, don't worry about them too much because they are, most of them are, are actively working. And there's also like, it's, yeah, I mean, that the, if you're a white guy, don't worry. Um, <laughs> but, but there are also ways in this business to like, you know, we, we need some of the people who have gotten successful to then help like partner with with women or people of color and to help them up and, and do things together. So um, I feel like there are more opportunities and it's actually, it's hard to find a female showrunner who's not working right now. Like they, they're, the world is their oyster a little bit, to be honest with you. That is very heartening, honestly. Yeah, no, there's like, hey, do you wanna do this? Do you wanna do that? But for me, I'm like, well, if I wanna do something, I don't want it to fail and I know, I know what I'm good at and, and, and not good at. So I have to be careful about, about what I choose because I want it to be, be good. But there are, there are certainly a lot of opportunities more and more. Well, that's interesting that you mentioned streaming platforms because it is just like a whole new world. And I just wondered, I, is it different? How is it different if you're doing a show, working with a streaming company like Netflix or whatever versus working with a network is it or is it not is there no difference at all um um my dream is to work at netflix because they have a reputation of not noting their um their writers to death and uh, explain what that means for anyone who might not it's just giving you constant notes on your material till you have officially sucked the life out of like whatever project you were writing it is it is horrible but i also worked at amazon where they gave constant notes and that was a very painful experience so because there used to be a reputation that the networks were really heavy-handed and a lot of notes but if you went to the streaming platforms they didn't give you notes and then that changed because then all of the executives from the networks ended up working at the studios <laughs> and everyone wants to think that they're the the end-all be-all um and that's just also a few things. If you are a writer, try to hold on to your uniqueness, your creativeness, your your specific specificity and your voice that makes you unique and different. And hold on to that and, and showcase that and platform that in your writing. Um, and then and then the real challenge when you sell something and is to make them think that you're nice and easy to work with and collaborative, but also like be able to push back and hold on to what's special without letting them ruin it. And honestly, I, I haven't, I haven't nailed that. Um, because that's I often that's a, tall feel, order. that's a tall order. Yeah. It's a tall order when like the head of the network is asking you to make a change and you do it. And they're like, Oh, we love working with you because you're so flexible. And then I look at that episode and it doesn't test well. And I'm like, I know, cause it sucks because I listen to you, but is that their fault or is that my fault? That's yeah. my fault. Elizabeth. <laughs> I'll answer that question. It's my fault. I mean, it's, it's interesting though, because a lot of what you're saying, like a common thread is building relationships. A common thread through a lot of what you've said today is building the relationships and trust, you know, 
having people you trust to work with and who trust you to do you, you know, yeah. and don't pressure you to change things that are going to make something not work anymore. Yeah. And also being, being good to work with is important. Like there was a writer I was trying to, to hire on my last show, like mid season, we needed someone new to come in and, and help us out. And there was this writer I really, really wanted and he was a white guy. So they still get jobs guys. Um, <laughs> And, but I was worried he was going to turn us down because he had other options and this and that. And, uh, and then I heard that, like, um, he thinks he's going to take it. He's, he's doing some recon on you. Like he's calling other writers or oh whatever, gosh. as you do. No, but as you do, because you don't know, you know, whatever. And I was like, oh, good. I'm going to, this is going to go great. Because I was like, if he asks other writers about me and, and we had, he and I had mutual friends and com I'm like, I'm going to nail this because other, um, I work well with other writers. I work, work with respect. Like it's good. There's a couple people he could have called in, in tricky areas of the business, but I was like, no, nah, that's not, you know, maybe a producer I was, who, who I pushed back too much, but as far as other writers, I'm, I'm, uh, very uh, respectful um, in a room. And um, anyway, so he came on board and we, we became fast friends and worked really well together. But I share that only because the way you work with people is important. The way you respect other people um, is, is important because people sure. do ask, we do call around and ask everybody about what is this person like to work with. Yeah, I guess, I mean, I guess that's like a common thread through a lot of industries, because as you were saying that, I was thinking, even at the State Department, people do that with each other, like, yeah. who's applying for a job? Are they, you know, how are they? Are they okay? It, yeah. It's interesting that you mentioned they could have, you know, you work so well with other writers, and you mentioned sometimes with actors who are pushing back, that can be difficult. What is your... Yeah, there are a couple of actors who would have not given me a glowing review. That is true. It is true. We won't ask for names, even though somebody in the chat did ask for names. We will not ask for names and put you on the spot. Okay, how, you would know them too. Oh gosh. Oh, wow. yeah. Curious. Um, how, <laughs> how involved are you on the set? Like, are you, I mean, I don't actually know what it looks like. Are, are writers, are you literally there while they're shooting everything and mm -hmm. then making changes as you go or having discussions? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, that's, a, that's actually, um, you know, that, that was in the question, what is the showrunner? The person, that's the person who runs the show. It's usually the person who created the show. It's like the top job of like, like putting all the pieces together. And uh, it's, 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 a, it's somewhat thankless. It's a job everybody wants to be in charge, but it's a little bit, it's, it's super hard. Um, and part of the hard part is at the time when you are on stage, um making adjustments to whatever they're shooting at that moment you also and this is the bigger machine the bigger picture at work you know especially if it's a tv show but perhaps even if it's a movie um but you also have like four other scripts that are due or six or 15 so it's like you're trying to be present on stage and that's why when an actor is like oh, i don't know about this i'm like I'm trying to write the, I'm trying to write the freaking like episode 26, dude. And you're like, Come on. Yes. Um, but so it's, it's a very bizarre, uh, you know, and then we'll always have other writers on set to, to do some of that. But I, I, I personally like to do a lot of my rewriting on set while it's happening. Like when the scene is, we shoot one, you know, uh, you shoot a take and then I realized mm, that didn't work as well. Let's say this, let's make these little adjustments and make little adjustments as we're going right up to the right, you know, the final shot. Wow. So it's just a constant creative process. Yeah, that's right. It never ends. That's right. What about a show? Like, I mean, on Dickinson, you are writing and you're acting in it. It is such a cool show, by the way, I've only watched like the first four episodes, but it is, I've never seen anything like that before. It's, such a stylistic mashup kind of with like the mm -hmm. modern and the period. And is, does that provide an extra challenge that you have kind of two roles you're playing, writer, producer, and actress? Um, not too much, especially now. And I, I will say, so the creator, Elena Smith, really gets all the credit for that. And, and the way, um, so in my position, um, 
having run previous shows, um, I was just asked to, um, to come on to this show. Elena had already been writing for like a month or so and to come that they wanted somebody, a higher level woman to sort of help her because she had never run her own show before. Um, so really I just came on as a, as a writer producer um, and then she ended up casting me as, as uh, Maggie, which was secondary. Um, but my job as a showrunner coming on, and this is happening more and more, especially as young as they need so much content and if some <clears throat> young person, <clears throat> somebody out there today gets your hands in the right, uh, your script in the right hands and somebody might be like, oh, we wanna make this but you don't have the experience having been in a room. So they'll attach you to somebody who has more experience to help you along. Sometimes those marriages are really ugly and there's a power struggle, but um, I was very, um, I've done it a couple of times um, and it's, I've always become best friends uh, with the person I was hired to help. Um, and Elena is so friggin' smart. And I would just literally, my advice was more about like, this is your baby. This is like, I can't even get in here in terms of how your mind is working to create all these elements. But let me tell you some things I've learned about like arcing out this season and, and how we're going to keep our main character activated. And, and she would tell me what she envisioned. And then I would help her like, like structure that in a way that made some story sense. So that's a little more my, my, writer producing role on this particular show. It's really to be the wind beneath somebody else's wings um, and a support system for her and to like, you know, call me when you're stuck and, um, and all that. And but playing that's, is like a bonus, basically. Exactly, exactly. Very cool. Um, can we, I know we only have about 10 minutes left, but can you talk a little bit about the process of creating and working on the big C, which is like, for those of you who hadn't, haven't seen it, it's just, it's such an amazing show. It sounds crazy, but a comedy about a woman who's dying of cancer, but it's, it's so quirky and wonderful and funny. And Laura Linney's so amazing in it. How did that show come to be? Well, you know, that's another um, sort of, it falls in the category of like, right, what, what you, you know, trust your gut. Um, so I actually, sat down with a producer so a woman who worked her i don't know how, what her first job was but probably some mailroom adjacent job and uh she said you know i've been we were just sharing ideas and she said um i think it's time for a cancer comedy and there was just something that like that spoke to me about that because i just sort of like like dealing with dark things in a light way um and I went back home and I was like, let me think if, see if I can find a way in. And I've told this story before, but I just had my, my first baby and I looked at my baby and I was like, oh my God, I like, she's so sweet. I want to be with her for her whole life, but I'm going to die. Like best case scenario is that I die and she lives. And then I, I literally hadn't confronted my mortality before that, but I was like, oh shit, I'm going to die. Um, so that was sort of the, the creative impetus for me getting behind this story. Um, and then I went back to that producer. I was like, let's try this. Let's, you know, I think I have some ideas. And then my agent tried to talk me out of it. Um, the studio was not that into it. Like everyone was trying to talk us out of it. Uh, but we just soldiered on, um, and, and then sold it to, to the, the a cable network who was super excited. And I think ultimately for them, it wasn't edgy enough. They wanted it to be even more so crazy and dark and, and whatever. But, um, but, and then that was sort of almost kind of kicked off like a period of time and streaming of the dramedy, like the half hour mm -hmm. dramedy. And now things have swung the other way. Now, now I'm hearing in the streaming world, like they want their dramas to be dramas and their comedies to be comedies. And Oh. That's, where, that's where we're at on that. That's but also, yeah. Because that's, I mean, that's what's so wonderful about that, about that show. At, at what process do, I guess you've already sold the show to a network or to a streaming platform before the sort of casting 
starts to happen or do actors sometimes get attached to things before that point and become a selling point when you're pitching the project? Yeah, they, they absolutely can. And that, that can be like, a, that's also why, um, you know, a package really, really does sell things. Um, this this um, last series that I did a half hour called Call Me Cat that Elizabeth mentioned, I starred Maya Bialik. So we went in with a pitch. She was from the Big Bang Theory, like a really long running successful half hour show out here. Um, so she's, she's very famous in the half hour world. Um, and really they, we ended up getting, selling that to all four networks and getting like a big offer in place. Um, and that was entirely because of her. I mean, it was a little because of me because I just worked with the network and we enjoyed working together. But the fact that they, it was ended up being such a big deal um, was because of her, because they were like, we already have a star attached. We don't have to go look for a TV star. We have a star. Um, so, so yeah, that, and she was attached before I wrote the first word just off of the pitch. Yeah. Wow. So sometimes you're pitching not just to networks, but actually to actors. That's really yeah. interesting. Yeah. Um, just as a, a few people asked, and so maybe this is like a good place for us to, like a good, le a good question to end on about how do you, how do you pitch a show? I mean, how do you, okay, so yeah, so if, if I'm literally just pitching the show without having the script, because there's so many ways to go now that you can write a, uh, a script you know, what we call a spec script where you just write it on your own and you didn't, you didn't get anybody to weigh in on it. And then and now with some streaming services, sometimes you'll have your pilot script and then you're gonna pitch the series. Um, but um, a lot of times you'll just go in with the pitch and you're pitching the story and then they, they pay you to write it. But to get to that point, you will have had to have some sort of material written that they liked well enough to meet with you and to trust you as a writer. Um, but you know, there's kind of a, a very specific formula and it's a little bit like, um, I mean, it sort of follows, it, it follows a certain logic, um, but there is some, I, I once got a hold of a, um, a studio that they have a little cheat sheet that they send to their writers to follow this formula. But if it's for a TV show, like, First, you talk about your personal connection to the material, why you, why you really want to write this show about gamblers, because your dad was a gambler and gambled your house away as a child and whatever, it's a personal story, whatever. And then you, and then you get into, you know, the, the title and the genre, it's going to be a one hour drama, uh, family drama, kind of like, you know, whatever. Um, and then you get into the tone. Is it going to be funny? Is it going to be serious? Is it going to be whatever? Um, and then you just get into your characters and you run through your different characters. Um, and then you give it examples of some episode ideas and what episodes are going to look like and how they're going to play out and maybe a, a sense of the overall arc in the first season, kind of where you're going from point A to B. But I mean, this whole, so that's like a whole world you're creating. And it's really like, they really want the emotions underneath it. Like why, why you're going to tell this story and why it's important. Um, you know, but ultimately that's a 30 to 45 minute wow. pitch. Um, yeah. yeah, let's say 45 minutes. I'm, I'm I tend to be long winded, but uh, <laughs> You're like I'm telling my life story. As I... Yeah, but it's a lot. But it's but it's a it's a very sort of like clean and clear um, kind of structure to 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 convey all the information. That makes sense. That makes sense. Um, I lied. I'm going to ask one more question, if you don't mind, uh, which is based on your experience. Would you would your advice to actors? Because I know we have a lot of act and people interested in acting on uh, with us today. Would, is, would your advice to them be to write, to try to write for themselves and try to use that as a vehicle and to explore their own creativity? Or is that something that uh, worked for you, do you think? You know what's strange? I am, uh, my, my gut is to say no. And the reason I'm gonna say that strangely, and then I'm gonna double back, but a friend of mine, um, 
she said that that's what people kept telling her to like create. And she's a, you know, she's been working for years um, in the business and like small parts and this and that. Um, and then got really into looping. That's where you do the, um, you're the people in movies and TV shows. You have the walla, 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 like the, the people. Wow. The weird voice. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> or weird yeah. job, rather. <laughs> yeah. It, but right. But she, people who do it make so much money. It's a competitive business. They get residuals. She, her house is so much nicer than mine. It's like, <laughs> they make, but she was making so much money looping that she hadn't been spending as much time just going out as an actor. So people kept telling her, well, you got to make your own stuff. So then she wrote this little um, kind of like a spec pilot. She cast me in it. We had a ball. She shot it at her house. It looked beautiful. And she's been sending that out. And she's been getting some meetings, but she's frustrated because she thought it was going to, she wanted some, she wanted them to be like somebody to be like, Oh, this is a great idea. Okay, I'll I'll write it. I'll be the writer and turn it into a series and then I'll cast you in it. Uh -huh. But instead, people are like the same thing that happened to me when I showcased my talent. They were like in, in a show, they were like, okay, well, what else you got? Like, or okay, then then write more. Like it really only showcased her as a writer and an idea person yeah, and not specifically as an actor. So, but that's screwed up. So, so I don't know what to, and she spent all this money on this film, but she's like, no, I just wanted somebody to see my acting and cast me on something. Yeah, she's like, I don't want to write this. I want to be yes. <laughs> Right, and then as a writer, I'm always like, oh, I know you're one of those types who's like, hey, you write my story, you write it. And I'm like, thanks, I got my own, I got my own stories. But, <laughs> um, but so that is a very like, it's a very tricky thing, right? Because then I'm telling you not to showcase your acting, but I, maybe I'm saying, be careful what you wish for, because um, just know that if you write something and, and you showcase yourself that way, like do it because you're passionate about all of it. Do it because you, you, you really are passionate about it and, and then be ready to sort of to um, ride the wave where, wherever it's going to take you. Um, but just in terms of being an actor, I mean, there are, there are so many ways to just, you know, just keep auditioning and getting out there and taking classes and doing plays and getting an agent and going and honing your craft um, in every way possible. That's I, actually, I, th I think being passionate about what you're doing is a great message for everybody, no matter what your field is, if it's writing, producing, acting, uh, baking, what are, any job really. So I think that's actually a really nice sentiment to close on. Um, oh my gosh, this hour flew by. <laughs> Sorry, it went so quickly. I hope we got to enough of your questions, everybody. Um, I so too. I really do. I, I admire you all. I appreciate you being here. I am just, uh, there's only a few faces I can say, and you are the boldest among you, I say. Though that when you're <laughs> actually show your face, oh, there's another. Um, but anyway, I, I mean, again, if there's um, this business is so crazy and it can be so hard. But I will, I will tell you from the beginning of like when I just got out of college and I was like, here I am. Um, I just, I, I've just always loved it. Like I've always loved Hollywood or whatever your Hollywood is, and maybe it's my Hollywood too. But. Um, you know, I've, I've loved the idea of the business. I grew up uh, watching TV. And, and so if you try to just keep the passion alive and let the, the joy outweigh the, the, the rejection, um, that's, my, that's my wish for you. That's a beautiful wish. Um, thank you all so much for being here. If you are interested in this topic, our next behind the scenes event is May 20th. Thank you for coming, Darlene. Thank you so, so much. It's been nice. such a joy nice to catch to up with you. Bye, Sersha. Bye, everybody. Thanks so much. Have a good evening.